Hello, my name is Jean-Jacques Nantel. In the second video of this series, I explained that Europe was probably the continent where producing wealth was the most profitable. In the case of Russia, however, which is a part of Europe, it's the opposite. In Russia, everything is more difficult, uh, farther, colder, and costlier. In Western Europe, the ocean is never far away, which explains why its economy is oriented towards the, the Atlantic Ocean, while Russia has an economy oriented towards the east, towards the, the center of Asia, which is a very massive continent. The two regions look in different directions. If it's always easy to move on the flat surface of, of an ocean, especially if we use sailboats, on a continent, each and every movement is costly. Every kilometer of road or of railroad must be built and maintained. In the case of Russia, those costs have always been important since the country crosses 11 time zones on top of having a total area of 17 million square kilometers. Russia is almost as large as the combined areas of Canada and USA, which are the third and the fourth largest countries on the planet. If Russia is so gigantic, it's mainly because the Tsars and their communist heirs have fought for centuries to expand their very flat and indefensible territory until reaching natural obstacles like the Caspian Sea, the Caucasian Mountains, the Black Sea, the Carpathian Mountains, the Baltic Sea, the Arctic and the Pacific Oceans, etc. If the Russians were able to, con to conquer all that territory, and especially Siberia, it was because the Industrial Revolution had given them the firearms they needed to defeat the nomadic horsemen who, until the 16th century, regularly came from the east to invade and ransack Eastern Europe. The main problem Russia had during its eastern expansion was the fact that the vast majority of its citizens lived west of the Ural Mountains, while the wealth of the country was located in Siberia. Even today, it's a costly problem since most Russians refuse to live in such a harsh climate if they are not paid a larger salary. And even then, a lot of those immigrants go back to Europe as soon as they can. In Russia, the state must constantly fight against human nature and against geography. Since Siberia is the natural reserve of raw materials needed by an underdeveloped Asia, all the successive Chinese uh, Russian governments have invested heavily to develop the Siberian east-west infrastructure in order to bring back in Europe, and not in Asia, the resources of the, of the region. It's noteworthy that Russians, who are tropical animals like all human beings, have conquered Siberia by settling in an east-west corridor located at the extreme south of Siberia. If that corridor had a milder climate that facilitated the Russian colonization, it was unfortunately located far from the Arctic Ocean and from the richest mineral deposits of the region. It is in that east-west corridor that Russians built the two Trans-Siberian railways which link the main cities of the region. The fact that the main rivers of the region flow in a south-north direction was also a problem which forces the Russian government to develop the, the northeast passage near the coast of the Arctic Ocean in order to send back to Europe the natural resources produced along those rivers. That Northeast Passage is another east-west infrastructure which links the small mining towns disseminated along the Arctic Ocean. If the development of Siberia made Russia a continental power, 
It didn't change the fact that Russia has one of the longest coastlines of the world. It's perfectly clear when we compare that coastline with the coastline of China. It's only in the Arctic that Russia is an oceanic power, since none of the other Arctic countries of the world has developed an Arctic infrastructure as complete as the one built by Russia. In fact, the total absence of non-Russian cities on the other shores of the Arctic Ocean has transformed that ocean in a Russian lake. On its other borders, Russia possesses very few harbors which are ice-free all year round. There is of course Vladivostok, which is located at the other end of the country on the Pacific Ocean. There is also St. Petersburg on the, on the Baltic Sea and the harbors of the Black Sea, which include Sebastopol. I read somewhere that a history teacher used to ask to the students who had prepared a paper on Great Britain, did you say that England was an island? That was a wise question, since uh, certain geographical facts are extremely important to understand the geopolitics of a nation. The best expression to describe China is a lot. In Saudi Arabia, it is the desert. In uh, Russia, it is the cold. If Russians have always been relatively poor and will always be, it is because they always wasted a large proportion of their gross domestic product to fight against the cold, the ice and the snow. Foreign visitors are often astonished by the fact that Russian technologies are much more robust than their, uh, their own. In Russia, the trucks, the trains, the ice breakers, the helicopters, the airplanes, the road, the bridges, the power lines, etc. have all been designed to withstand extremely cold weather. It's even true for their spaceships. In Siberia, it is often impossible to stop the petroleum flow in the pipelines during the winter. In the past, it often occurred that the railway had to be abandoned because the regular passage of the trains had melted the frozen ground on which it had been built. In the far north, when a technician is sent to repair an instrument, it's often an old team that must follow him, an helicopter, an helicopter pilot, a mechanic, a cook, a nurse, etc. To those costs, we must add those related to the accidents and to the and the sometimes horrific wounds caused by frost bites. In northern Quebec, the natives often say that nobody should go out past 40 degrees Celsius. In Siberia, there are many regions where the temperatures regularly fall below 50 degrees. And there are even regions like the Kolyma in northeastern Siberia where uh, it, it often goes below 60 degrees Celsius. There is a song that all Russians know, which says, Oh, Kodima, Kodima, enchanted planet. The winter lasts 12 months, all the rest is summer. In the far north, all the houses must be equipped with a 1.5 meter deep basement and with an efficient eating system. They must also have two walls, two roofs, two doors, two windows, etc. All the inhabitants must also have three different sets of clothes, one for the winter season, one for the summer, and one for the spring autumn seasons. The food must also be more abundant than in the tropical countries. In Siberia, the costs of winter are so important that many mining companies exploit only the largest and the richest mineral deposits. Now that we talked about the enormous cost uh, related to the Russian geography and climate, let's talk about the gigantic waste of human beings uh, produced by the eternal scorn 
of uh, Russian autocrats for the lives of their fellow countrymen. If modern Russians are westernized, culturally they are far from being like the other Europeans since they didn't know the Greco-Roman world, the Middle Ages and the Crusades, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the wars of religion, the Enlightenment, or the intense intellectual debate that gave birth to our modern democracy. What Russians experienced very deeply, however, was the extreme brutality of their leaders who robbed, enslaved, or massacred them during millennia. Of course, when you live in a flat and indefensible country like Russia, Everybody feels the need to have a strong leader and a powerful army to protect the population and its border. Unfortunately, dictators, especially when they live in a faraway capital, tend to treat their soldiers as if they were cannon fodder. It's even worse when those leaders are foreigners. Originally, Russia has been created by Viking merchants who came from Scandinavia and used the Russian rivers to reach the Black Sea and the Byzantine Empire where they, they sold highly prized northern goods like furs, amber and slaves. It's because most of those slaves came from Russia that the word Slav became synonym for slaves. The Russian Tsars, who took the power after the Viking warlords, didn't show more respect for their mujiks since they never hesitated to sacrifice tens of thousands of them every time they waged a war. If they could do that, it was because the Russian soil, the famous Chernozem, was so fertile that it allowed the Russian farmers to raise large families on small patches of land. When, at the beginning of the 18th century, the Tsar Peter the Great decided to westernize Russia by founding St. Petersburg on the Baltic Sea, he did not hesitate to sacrifice 100,000 lives to build it. As expected by Peter the Great, however, this new capital provoked the massive importation of Western ideas and technologies that would upset an archaic culture that had remained unchanged for centuries. Till the end of the 19th century, the Tsars were able to protect themselves against those foreign ideas by sending to Siberia all the intellectuals and the dissenters who dared talking against them. An important effect of the westernization of Russia was the rapid increase of its population. That demographic revolution was so obvious that Dmitry Mendeleev, the inventor of the periodic table, calculated around the year 1900 that the Russian population would reach 800 million people in the year 2050. The Russian territory, which already comprised Siberia was then so vast that it seemed logical to think that the future masters of Russia would use those millions of new citizens to populate the, the, their empty eastern territories. This is precisely what they did, but in a totally unproductive manner by deporting in Siberia millions of prisoners who were forced to work in labor camps without ever having the possibility to raise a family. Mendeleev couldn't imagine the extent of the demographic catastrophe the Russian people would live during the 20th century. The massacre began, began during the First World War under the rule of Nicholas II, the last of the Tsars. Poorly trained and equipped, the Russian army had then the reputation to attack its enemies fearlessly, waves after waves until victory. Everybody was then talking about the Russian steamroller. That tactic, however, 
killed and maimed so many Russian soldiers during the First World War that it was one of the main causes of the 1917 Russian Revolution. That revolution, which started in St. Petersburg, was launched by intellectuals like Lenin and Trotsky who refused to understand how worked an industrial economy or what motivates human workers. Very few of those Bolshevik leaders had ever managed a real industrial enterprises and they, are, and they all believed that the most anti-economic theories of Karl Marx were true. For instance, they thought that profits were always the result of a theft. Those theoreticians were those who imposed communism on an agricultural Russia that hadn't developed any of the cultural antibodies the Western world had developed since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. For the peasants of Russia, ideas like democracy, the human rights, the separation of power, free journalism, or uh, legal and efficient trade unions were still foreign ideas when uh, communism became the official uh, ideology of their state. Since the first leaders of the USSR, especially Stalin, wanted to uh, catch up as soon as possible with the industrial economies of Europe, they launched a series of political uh, uh, campaigns made up uh, of uh, show trials, of massacres, and of mass deportations to eliminate the saboteurs of the Soviet economy. In reality, most of the failures of the Soviet economy were due to the fact that the system rewarded blind obedience rather than initiative, creativity, and productivity. The incompetence of the Soviet leaders was even more obvious when there was a war since, according to their own propaganda, 26 million Soviet citizens lost their lives during the Second World War, a war that they won. Their scorn for the lives of their soldiers was so gr great that when they ordered them to attack a German position, they often placed machine guns behind them with the order to shoot anyone who would retreat. Stalin even wrote somewhere, when a man dies, it's a tragedy. When one, mi one million men die, it's a statistic. The peasants and the intellectuals were the main victims of the Soviet systems. Historians have calculated that from 1917 and 1991, the year the USSR collapsed, the different communist regimes of the world have killed more than 100 million people. And we didn't talk about the hundreds of millions of descendants they didn't produce. All those massacres explain why, at the beginning of the 21st century, the modern urbanized Russia is losing population so rapidly. A young Russian once told me, at least the Nazis were killing people they considered as foreign enemies, but in Russia, our leaders were killing Russians. If communism collapsed, it was because it was based on the fear instilled in the population by professional assassins on, exten on an extensive corruption system, on the systemic waste of natural resources, on the stealing of Western technologies, on the looting of many countries in Eastern Europe and in the 14 non-Russian Soviet republics, and what is much more important, on the exploitation of tens of millions of slaves who worked for free in the mines and the forests of the, the Gulag archipelago. The most costly legacy of communism was probably the fact that it encouraged the laziness and the negligence of the workers whose production was so bad that sometimes nobody wanted to buy it. You can imagine the environmental damage caused by such a system. 
One of the best examples of it was given by the Aral Sea in Central Asia, which almost disappeared because the Soviet planners had diverted the waters of the rivers which filled it in order to increase the productivity of some corn fields. Now that we talked about the cost of the internal problems of Russia, let's talk about the enormous cost of the Russian army. Since Russia has 14 neighbors, its leaders are forced to maintain a permanent, powerful and well-equipped army, an army which spends, spends a lot of energy to regularly move from one border to another. In the past, the immensity of the Russian territory has sometimes been an advantage, especially when a powerful enemy was attacking the country. When that happened, the Russian generals could, bu could uh, buy time by ordering a general retreat on hundreds of kilometers. On top of weakening the enemy, such a retreat allowed them to wait for the winter month during which they could launch a devastating counter-offensive. It was the strategy they used against Hitler and against Napoleon. Another example of the advantages of having such a large territory has been given during the Cold War when the Russian authorities published false coordinates for many of their cities to make sure that any atomic bomb launched to destroy them would fall on empty valleys. Despite those real strategic advantages, Russia remains a superpower which cannot easily project its power far from its borders. First, it doesn't have an easy access to the ice-free oceans of the world. If the Pacific Ocean is totally dominated by Russia, as we uh, uh, said earlier, it is normally covered with ice and has few natural exits. Second, on its other maritime borders, Russia do possess harbors like St. Petersburg on the Baltic Sea and those of the Black Sea, but the movement of the Russian fleet stationed there can easily be controlled by the maritime straits belonging to different hostile powers. Third, if Russia as Vladivostok on the Pacific Ocean, that harbor is located very far from the great population centers of Russia and very close to those of China. Now, let's talk about the almost inevitable conflict that will someday oppose China and Russia for the control of Siberia and its resources. If modern China is actively developing the new Silk Road which passes through Central Asia, and the Maritime Silk Road, which passes through the South China Sea and the Strait of Malacca, it's because its leaders want to diversify their sources of raw materials. If the Russian didn't have a formidable nuclear arsenal, the problem of those, uh, the scarcity of raw materials could easily be solved by a superpower like China by invading Siberia. After all, the more than 100 million Chinese living in the northeastern part of China, of China are facing only 8 million of Russians. Since the Chinese are aware of their demographic superiority, they took advantage of the recent conflict between Russia and Ukraine to industrialize an island located on the Amur River just a few kilometers away from the strategic Russian city of Khabarovsk. Obviously, the Chinese government is getting ready to invade Russia if it ever has the chance to do so. The strategic situation China has inherited at the end of the colonial era was so bad that the possession of Siberia will play a critical geopolitical role during the 21st century. To begin with, the Russian region containing Khabarovsk and Vladivostok impedes China to have an easy access to the Sea of Japan. The Russian control of Siberia also cuts China from the Bering Strait, the Northeast Passage, and the Arctic Ocean with all its resources. 
Of course, if China was to invade Siberia, the Russians would have plenty of time to react since the Chinese army would be forced to use the, the east-west infrastructure built by Russia. On top of provoking a strong international reaction, such an attack could easily be countered by Russia by launching atomic bombs on the communication lines of, an, of the advancing Chinese army. It's very unlikely that China would launch a nuclear war it would lose if atomic bombs were used against its army in Siberia rather than on a, on a Chinese territory. In that conflict, Russia would have the support of the people living in Mongolia exterior and of the ethnic minorities living in Siberia, since everybody knows that China brutalizes its minorities living in Tibet, in Xinjiang, and in Mongolia interior. China has even organized an invasion of those homelands by millions of Chinese colonists. As a result, Russia can be certain to keep Mongolia as an ally that will continue to play the role of a buffer state between Siberia and China. There is more. The Chinese living in the northeastern part of China have a very low birth rate and leave the region en masse to go back in southern China. Contrary to the Russians, the Chinese are not used and don't want to live and work in such a cold climate. It's important to realize that the Chinese never tried to colonize Siberia during the last 4,000 years. Their natural instinct has always been to remain behind their Great Wall and to do commerce with the Siberian natives. Before concluding this video, I would like to say that the Western world is presently ill-advised to try to destroy, weaken or divide Russia by arming Ukraine. In particular, the United States, who lead the anti-Russian uh, coalition in that war, have no uh, national interest to defend in Ukraine since they are a maritime power, while Russia is a continental power. Their confrontation, which really started in 1945, is like the confrontation that would oppose uh, an elephant to a whale. It has no purpose. The two nations have complementary and different uh, interests and they should cooperate rather than uh, fighting each other. Anyway, who would benefit if uh, Russia was to explode in different political entity? To China, of course, a country whose, uh, whose problems will be the subject of the fourth video of this series. If you enjoyed the present video, give it a thumbs up, uh, recommend it to your friend, and subscribe to my channel. See you next time.